evening. What is today? It's October 12th. Is this October? This is September. I'm making that up. It's October. October 12th, 2022. My name is Douglas Griffin. Uh, we're studying the book of John. Started John 1. We've gone up to John chapter 10 now. I uh, want to do a little background on it. Uh, Jesus is in Jerusalem, which he did not like to go to Jerusalem, which is kind of the opposite of how we normally think. It's like, oh, he was always in Jerusalem. Actually, he was seldom in Jerusalem. He went three times a year for the feast days, but then didn't stay because Jews, Jerusalem was dominated by the Pharisees who were totally against him and totally brainwashing everybody, hey Susie, to, to be against him. In Galilee, up in Galilee, way north, they loved him some Jesus. That's where he got all his disciples from. Even in Samaria, which was this area where they this very alienated from the rest of uh, Israel, they, they listened to him because people who are, that's why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are who's hunger and thirst. People who are more desperate for God are really open to it. Uh, people who think they know all about God actually don't know what they think. And I mean, don't think as much, don't know as much as they think is what I'm trying to say. And so they, they're more resistant when actual God shows up. So, uh, and that's why Jesus called them the blind. You're kind of blind because you think you see. If you if you really were blind, then you would see because, you know, you'd be like, oh, please, I want to see. But because you think you see, you're not listening to anything I'm saying because you think you already have all the answers. So, um, he's, he's there, though. Um, he came down in October of his third year. He's, he's, it's a three and a half year ministry. He's got six months to go before he knows he's going to the cross. And um, starting in chapter 7, he came down for the Feast of Tabernacles. They brought to him the woman caught in adultery because they were trying to trap him. Uh, again, they cared nothing about her. They're just trying to trap Jesus. Uh, in chapter, That's chapter 8. Chapter 9, he healed a blind man, which really infuriated them. And so now he's kind of um, dealing with the aftermath of that, which he knew was going to happen. The blind man was healed, and they got mad at him and kicked him out of the temple. He's, it's Jesus versus the Pharisees. They're his biggest problem in Jerusalem. And he's frustrated them because it's the blind leading the blind. And this is their, you're both going to fall into a ditch. You, you are not leading these people to me. You're leading them into a set of traditions you've invented. And those traditions won't get them into heaven. And so... Um, He's actually talking with some Pharisees in chapter 9 who have asked him, who have said to him, uh, are we also blind? And that's to whom he says, well, if you actually were blind, then you'd see. But because you think you see, you're blind. And they're, and they're surprised because it's like, we're here walking with you. We haven't said anything against you. And Jesus is going to point out in chapter 10, you also haven't said anything for me. You're watching people get excommunicated and thrown out of the temple, and you're not saying that's wrong. You're not standing up. So people are getting injured, people are getting misled, and you're not, uh, you're, you're complicit. So you're not the ones injuring them, but you're the ones allowing them to get injured. And he uses, which we'll see, the metaphor of the hireling who's supposed to be watching the sheep. You're not really the shepherd, you're just the hireling. And, and, and you're letting the wolves come in and steal the sheep and, and do the damage. And so you're just as bad because uh, even though you're not committing, inflicting the damage, you're allowing it to happen. So, so he's going to talk about two categories, the ones who are really inflicting the damage and the ones who are letting it happen. So I want to go over John chapter 10 because there's this famous verse that we have interpreted a, a certain way. And it's only in the last... Like the, since the 1950s, interestingly enough, uh, this verse, uh, people started saying, oh, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief is the devil. And that became a popular thing. Uh, no one really checked it. Uh, you just hear it, and it makes sense. Oh, yeah, the thief, the devil steals, kills, and destroys. The, that must be the devil. The thief is the devil. That's who he was talking about. And without going back and reading the context, we've gotten it wrong. Interestingly, if you read commentary all the way back to Jesus' time in the 
second century, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, nineteenth centuries worth of commentary, church fathers always said the thief is the Pharisees. Uh, but in this last, I don't know, seventy-five years or so, we've been teaching that the thief is the the devil. Uh, and there's a reason people teach it, and so I'm gonna, I want to I want to focus on this verse. But let me let's let's just back up so I can focus on it. So John chapter ten verse one, he says, "Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, by the gate, by the door, but climbs in some other way, the same as a thief and a robber." So if you're they're my sheep, but if you're getting to them through some other way than the door, now he's going to later say, "I'm the door." If, if you are getting to the sheep, but not using me as the door, if you're not saying that I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, uh, straight and narrow is the, is the path. If, if you're not leading people to the Messiah in order to get to God, then you're really robbing them. You're, you're a thief. Uh, and just like in a regular thing, if, 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 um, if a shepherd has led his sheep into this little pasture while he's out shopping, Right, so shepherds would come to Jerusalem, and you would lead your sheep into to the sheepfold where they kept all the sheep. Uh, you went through the gate. If somebody wanted to steal your sheep, they they were they hopping over the gate. I mean, they're, they're not going through the main door, right? They're sneaking around the back. And so he's saying, you're you're like that. You're like somebody who the sheep don't belong to you, but you're stealing them from their purpose they were intended for. The reason he is talking about this is because in Ezekiel chapter 34, it talks about the shepherd, the good shepherds and the bad shepherds. And he's trying to say, I'm the good shepherd that was spoken of in Ezekiel 34. He, Jesus never just came up with some strange analogy, although we think so. That One day Jesus just went, you know, God is like a shoe. And just out of nowhere, he would just say something odd. He's always quoting scripture to them. You know the scriptures he's saying to them. And so how the scriptures said the Messiah was, is going to come, he's going to be the good shepherd, and then there are the bad shepherds. That's what I'm referring to. That's happening right in front of your eyes. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 4, God is yelling at the bad shepherds. And he says, the weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back that which was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you ruled. And he's talking about the bad, bad shepherds. So he's now differentiating them between himself, between the bad shepherds, because it, it will later go on to talk about the good shepherd. Uh, in, John, in John 10, verse 2, it says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So the ones that I've actually sent, because he's going to say, I'm the door. I'm the door. So in this analogy right now, I'm the door. I'm going to change the analogy in about five verses. But right now, I'm the door. So the, 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 the priests that I have sent, they come in through the door. They know that they have to go through me. The, the, the uh, disciples that I'm training at Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, et cetera, et cetera, they, have, they're gonna, they know to come through me to lead people to me, that that's how you get to heaven. But you have come up with your own way, so you're a thief. So the good ones who've entered by the door, they're the shepherds that I've sent. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 3, says, but I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them. So the bad shepherd have let them just wander away, uh, but I will bring them back and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. So I'm going to send shepherds. So right now he's saying, so the shepherds who come through me because I'm the door. Those are the ones I've sent. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 3. So to him, the doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, the shepherds that I have sent, right? Because I said in Jeremiah, I was going to send shepherds. The sheep hear his voice, he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Still talking about his disciples, not talking about himself yet. Uh, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. They're like, what are you talking about? What? You're the, there's a door and the sheep and they didn't, they, you know. So he goes on to explain. Verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the door in this illustration. I'm the door. So and he goes, and all whoever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. So anyone who was 
because there were a bunch of false messiahs that have come through the past three or four hundred years. Actually, they came back from captivity in, in 534. And he said, I'd get him back from all nations. And now they're waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for the Messiah since 545 BC, right? Many people have shown up and claimed to be the Messiah, including uh, Epiphanes, Ariacus Epiphanes. All, all kind of people have shown up. I'm the Messiah. I'm a, and he says, anyone who's come before me and claimed to be the Messiah, they were thieves and robbers. And anyone now who's claiming that they have all knowledge and they're leading you and they're telling you and they're kicking you out of the temple and trying to bring adulterous women and have them stoned to death and thieves and robbers. Those are thieves and robbers, people who are doing that. So all that came before me, and he's talking about many people who've come before me, not talking about the devil. All those who come to, to shepherd the flock before me, they the same are thieves and, ro and robbers. So um, now, Going back to Jeremiah chapter 23, he says, Woe to the shepherds, verse 1, who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people, but obviously feeding them badly. You have scattered my flock. You've driven them away, not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. So you're going to get in trouble. So again, Jesus is referring to in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, I talked about the bad shepherds. Still not talking about the devil. I talked about the bad shepherds and the good shepherds. I'm going to send good shepherds who will feed you and woe to the bad ones. So Jesus says again in John chapter 10, verse 9, I'm the door. In this illustration, I'm the door. <laughs> and so if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So if you, you can go in and out and find pasture if you go through me. In Numbers chapter 27, Verse 15 says, Then Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. Let the God bring a shepherd who's going to be over the congregation, who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. So again, it's a shepherd analogy because they were shepherds. They had been shepherds ever since they went to Egypt with uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his sons showed up as shepherds. Shepherds is a thing that Israel does, so they understand these analogies, right? God has always used analogies in this way. So I want good shepherds that will lead, let them go in and out. We're going to get rid of the bad shepherds. So Jesus is here to identify now, by the way, those Pharisees, those are the bad shepherds because they're doing the opposite of what I want them to do. Now, in John chapter 10, verse 10, it says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. So he's been talking about the Pharisees ever since they brought the woman caught in adultery in the in, in chapter eight to and the man, the blind man who got kicked out. We're talking about the Pharisees and how horrible they are. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. In Zechariah, Zechariah, sorry, chapter eleven, verse sixteen, it says, For indeed I will raise up a shepherd in the land. So when the people have uh, gone astray and could care less about God's word, here's something important. Um, God puts the responsibility in all of us to care about his word, not just the ministers. Now, he may have the ministers study the Greek and the Hebrew and do all this research, but everybody's got to avail themselves to try to study God's word. And uh, there's there was a whole time period in Israel where they could care less about God's word. They weren't studying it, they weren't reading it, and they just gave themselves over to the whims of the Pharisees. Like, you read. You you study and you just tell us what the word says. And the Pharisees were telling, making just making up stuff. That the people had no idea. That's not in the Bible. That's not, I feel myself, find myself saying that a lot today. That's not in the Bible. Why? <laughs> but people think it is. Um, and But God says, when you do that, as a people, when you just don't care anything about the word. He says, I will raise up shepherds in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that, sh that still stand, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. If you don't care, I will allow people to come up and just do, you know, because you don't care. So you're going to be taken advantage of if you care enough, which I'm assuming people who listen to Bible studies like this and uh, and, or, and read the word and 
you know, whether you listen to this Bible study or somebody else's, you're saying, I care. I want to know more about the word. I want to know more about this person I'm supposed to be worshiping. So that's caring, right? doesn't mean you don't have to go off to Bible school and all that. You just have to make yourself available. How can I study the word? Well, I need to, I need, I need more of it. So that's caring. But they would, there's a whole time period. They didn't, no, they never read. They didn't care. They didn't go to temple. Eh. You just tell us what it says. And when we have that attitude, I'll just show up in church on Sunday. I'll let the preacher just tell me what it says, and then I'll go home and live my life. Then God says, okay, I'm going to allow you to be taken advantage of, because that's going to get your attention. You're going to later wake up and go, wait, what happened? I gave uh, $50,000 to that minister, and all he did was buy a jet with it and fly off to the Congo, and I never heard from him again. Well, that's your fault, because if you'd been reading the word, you would have known his voice, because he says the stranger's voice, they won't follow. If, you have, if we avail ourselves to the Bible, We'll recognize these charlatans. You'll know, but if you if you don't, then you, you, you're you easily fooled. Now, the reason I'm making a big deal about the thief is not the devil, the thief is not the devil, the thief is not the devil, is because saying that the thief comes, uh, the thief is the one who steals, kills, and destroys, and that's the devil, creates this dichotomy, this false dichotomy, that God is the God of good things, and the devil is the devil of bad things. When good things happen in your life, it's God. When bad things happen in your life, it's the devil. And it's almost creating two gods. It's making the devil as powerful as God because all good things come from God, all bad things from the devil. And so, oh, look what the devil just did. Oh, look what God did. Oh, look what the devil just did. As though there's two gods ruling this world. There's like this fight going on, like, like a football game where there's two teams and you don't know who's going to win today. Oh, hopefully God will win today. And God hates that idea. It's like, and, and that's why people started teaching the thief is the devil, because it allowed us to create a doctrine where any good thing that happens to you is God and any bad thing is the devil. And, 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 and so that when a bad thing happens, instead of checking ourselves, because that's what God wants us to do and going, why is this calamity happening? Why is this calamity? This is a horrible calamity. This is a bad consequence. Let me check ourselves. Let us together come together and pray and bow our heads and if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then will they hear from heaven, and, right? But if it's always the devil, then I never have to check. That bad thing happened, that was the devil. Oh, that horrible thing happened, that was the devil. And I never have to say, is there something I'm doing? And so God really hates that because he allowed the calamity to wake us up, right? So that we would check ourselves. What should we be doing differently? Now, that is different than a single person who's being influenced by the devil going crazy and shooting up everybody or something. A single person getting drunk and that's the devil getting in somebody's head. Yes, the devil can get in people's minds, but I'm talking about it when a calamity happens, a huge, that's God. We, we have to look at that and go, wow, look at that huge thing. The devil can't do that. In Isaiah chapter 44, and this is what we're going to, park and, and do some research here. Um, God is warning the people of the calamity that's about to happen to their nation. Through Isaiah, it's, it's, this is around 700 BC. And we know that they went into captivity around 600 BC. It was actually 595 or something, but around 600 BC. Um, and so 100 years in advance, which is what God will do. He'll warn you 100 years, he'll give you 100 years of warning. Because God doesn't want to bring allow the calamity. He doesn't want to. So he'll warn you for 100 years. Here's, a, here's what's going to happen. If you do that, here's going to happen to do that. Remember those commercials uh, that woman would scream at her husband, you kill yourself! You know, because she didn't want to, I, I think I think it was going to drive drunk or something like that. And and that's the that's the warning. You know, God's warning you. This terrible thing's going to happen. This terrible thing's going to happen. This terrible thing's going to happen. He'll warn you for 100 years. And then finally allow it, it to happen. And he wants us to go, wow, look, that calamity happens. We weren't listening to God. We need to check ourselves. He doesn't want us to go, well, that was the devil. I rebuke you, devil. Like, no, that was not the devil. That was me. I've been warning you how horrible the things are getting, and you're not listening. So he's warning them here in 700 uh, BC about something's going to happen in 600 BC. He's giving 100 years warning through Isaiah. Isaiah was 100 years before Jeremiah and all that stuff that happened. So. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. And that's not like there's two different people. That's just how the translation is. But I, however you consider me, 
I'm the Lord, I'm the King of Israel, I'm the Redeemer, I'm the Lord of hosts, in whatever names you call me. He says in Isaiah 44, 6, I am the first, I'm the last. Besides me, there is no God. No. So he wants you to know, I'm, there's not some other God who's doing all the bad stuff. There's no one else. And who can proclaim as I do? Mm. Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Mm. Since I appointed the ancient people. He said, so if you, if, if you can do what I do, show me. Show me what you got. He said, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Like it, it cause I've, I've told you hundreds of years ago, what's going to happen. A thousand years in advance. I declare things. I told Abraham, your people are going to be in Egypt for 400 years. You know, I, I say things way in advance. So if there's some other guy who can do that, who knows what's going to happen, please show it to me. Verse eight, do not fear, do nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? So if, don't be afraid of somebody. There is not some other God. I'm telling you in advance the things that are going to happen. Nobody else can do that. I'm the only one who can do that. And I've done it in the past. I'm going to do it again. It says, you are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Those who make an image, all of them are useless. Like you, you, you're creating gods and you're praying to them and you're asking them to do differently. Now, he's already told them. I'm just stopping here. He's already told them what's going to come. And they've prayed to these other gods they've created so that it would not happen. Uh, well, God's telling us that this bad thing's going to happen, but we're going to pray to this God and he'll stop it. Really? Let's see. So he's saying, this is going to happen. It's going to happen. And there, some of them are mad at God. Like, if you were really God, you would not let this thing happen. And he says, no, no, no. It's going to happen, but I've already got the cure for it that's also coming. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to that. But right now he's arguing and saying, why are you trusting in these other gods? There is no other god besides me. They, I'm telling you what's going to happen. They can't tell you in advance. They don't even speak. These are dumb gods. Why are you trusting in them instead of me? He says, uh, those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. So they should be, be ashamed of themselves. They don't. They can't see. They don't know anything. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? It's like, I don't get it. Why would you make... They don't... How? What's this rabbit foot going to do for you? So, now, in Isaiah chapter 44, I'm skipping down to verse 24, because I want to... Because he's painting this whole picture, right? He says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb... I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and the, the, drives diviners mad because you go to these babblers. He's just calling them babblers, these people who want to read your fortune. And Madam Sula wants to tell you, you know, for for, for $9.99, I'll, I'll read your fortune. Don't go to these babblers. He says he frustrates the babblers. He drives diviners mad who turns wise men backwards and make their knowledge foolishness. These people you're going to instead of listening to me, because I'm telling you what's going to happen. Disaster's coming unless you turn and repent. But you're not turning and repenting. You're just thinking you can avert it. You can't. Who confirms the word of his servant. So I told Isaiah what's going to happen, and I'm going to confirm that. And performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. So I'm telling you, people are going to come in and occupy this country. I'm, I, I, my servants, I told them what to say, and I'm going to confirm it. Again, it's God confirming what he told them. It's not them telling God, Isaiah saying to God, hey, God, I think you should destroy a whole bunch of people. God's told him, here's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to confirm it. So who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah, you shall be rebuilt, built and rebuilt, and I will raise up her waste places. So here's what I'm telling you. I'm going to destroy it, and then I'm going to rebuild it. So he's now actually talking about the rebuilding part of it, because it's, it's already going to happen that I'm going to destroy it. So, But I'm letting you know I'm going to rebuild it. And when that happens, you go, wow, there really is a God. Okay, who says to the deep, be dry. So I tell the waters to dry up, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, and they know who Cyrus is. Cyrus is the king of Persia at this point. 
not of so he's the king of Iran, not the king of Iraq. The king of Nebuchadnezzar, who's basically the king of Iraq, what modern day Iraq, is going to come and destroy. But I'm going to send Cyrus, who's going to allow it to be rebuilt. So who says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. So I've, he's already told them all the destruction. He's now actually on the good part about the redemption. And they're still denying that any the destruction is going to happen. It's like, not only is it going to happen, I'm going to rebuild because God's not interested in just destroying everything. He's interested in destroying it. Then you're going to learn a lesson. You're going to be in captivity for seven years. And then I'm going to rebuild it because I want what's best for you. I'm not allowing this destruction to hurt you. I'm not this destruction to show you, you need to listen to me again. You're going away from me and following these other gods who can't help you. Now, Isaiah 45, just the next chapter, he's still going on about Cyrus and what Cyrus is gonna do and how Cyrus is gonna help the rebuilding part. And again, they have not accepted even the destruction part yet, okay? So he says, I am the Lord, there is no other. There is no God besides me. This is Isaiah 45, 5. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. So he's saying, please don't divide up the world in that God creates light and the devil creates darkness. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God gives light, and the thief is the devil. Like, no, no, I do both things. There's not another God doing all this stuff. I create, so verse 7, I form the light. I create darkness. The, the, the good news about this is that it's God who's doing these things, so we know that it's not going to last. We know that it's going to be for our good. You want it to be God doing these things. You don't want there to be some enemy of the devil trying to kill everybody. That And God's going, oh, no, he's starting to win. What am I going to do? You want it to all to be from God because then you know it's all going to work out. You, you know, I want that judge to uh, – a friend of mine just went to this situation and was praying for a just judge and, like, and, and, and sat at the previous trial and went, oh, thank God I'm going to get that judge. It, she's a just judge. And, and she's going to hear both sides and her judgment will be fair. You want that person to be the judge of the universe. Even if they have to, you know, meet out some punishment, at least you know it's not going to be heinous. And, but you don't want some evil person meeting it out and God, there's nothing I can do about it. You don't want there to be some, the devil to be the thief who still kills and destroys. Because he's, 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 none of it will be for our good. So God's saying, I form the light. I create darkness. He says, I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do these things. Verse 8. So rain down you heavens from above. Again, here's the good news. Since I'm creating the calamity, I'm the one that's going to clean it up. You don't have to worry this is going to last forever. Rain down you heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. So I, it will be for your good. Righteousness will spring from this. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Now, here's a, the, the King James says, let the pot shirts strive with the pot shirts of the earth. And go, what? Let the pot shirts strive with the pot shirts of the earth. Now, the pot shirt is just a, is a broken piece of pottery. If you, the King James also lets us know that they added the word let and they added the word strive. They thought that was going to make it make more sense. Literally says, woe to him who strives with his maker the pot shirts with the pot shirts of the earth. Woe to him who strives with his maker and the potsherds with the potsherds of the earth. Um, it, you're, so he's the image of a, a pot who's, who's arguing with the potter. And the potsherds and the potsherds of the earth are, are, are arguing with the, with, the, with the potter, right? So we understand that image. Like the, 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 the piece of pottery is saying, How good, why did you make me thus? We know that whole thing, right? We've, we've read that recently. He says, uh, shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Can you imagine? You're trying to form something. In the, if the clay, first of all, if the clay starts talking to me, I'm out. But let's say someone, you know, from that culture that they're not afraid when things talk, when the house says, get out. You know that culture who they'll stay? Okay. If the clay starts arguing, you should still be mad. Like I'm the I'm the potter. You don't, the clay can't just argue to me and say, "What are you making?" Like you're the clay. 
So he says, shall the clay say to him who forms it, where do you make it? Or shall your handiwork say, he has no hands? Like, what? Clearly I have hands. Because uh, you're my handiwork. You don't, you don't even have hands. He should be making me. What? So, woe to him who says to his father, what are you begetting? And this is as the child's coming out of the mother's room. What are you begetting? Like, wait, you just got here. What are you arguing with me for? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? This is the baby coming out. It's like, how dare you? And he's saying, that's ridiculous, right? And that's, the, that's what you're doing. You're, you're arguing with me. And you're telling me what I should do. Don't worry. I, if I, I create the light. I create the darkness. I do both. When the darkness happens, it's from me for a purpose. Instead of arguing about it, learn the lesson from it. So that, okay, now, so he's given all these examples of do not argue with me, do not argue with me. Now, this next verse has been misinterpreted, and it bothers me, because if you read the context, there's no way to misinterpret this. But listen to it, and you'll see, I'm, I'm going to tell you what they have said, and then well, what obviously it means. So, verse 11. This is Isaiah 45, 11. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, not and his, his and, and the maker, uh, the maker of you, right? I'm, I'm not that the Lord has a maker, but I'm the Holy One of Israel. I'm the maker of the pot, of the pottery. So here's the maker talking to the pot, saying, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. So, I'm going to say that again. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. Now, people have, who've only read that verse say, see, this is saying you can ask of the Lord things to come concerning your sons and the work of God's hands, you can command him. Mm -hmm. You can command him. Because it says right there, you command me. Now, here's, the, here's the, the deal. There are no question marks in this Hebrew uh, writings. From the sentence itself, we can tell that it's a question, and they've added in the question marks. So when it says, uh, shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? And there's a little question mark there. Uh, shall the handiwork say, he has no hands? And we, they put a question mark there. They should have put a question mark here because it's in the same thing. Are the woman, are, are, are the woe to him who comes out, says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord, Holy One of, his, uh, of Israel and the maker. This is a question. You ask, ask me of things to come concerning my sons, concerning the work of my hands. You command me. It's a question. You're, because it goes in line with what he was just saying. You're going to question me. Is the, is the pot shirt going to question the potter? Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Shall your handwork say he has no hands? He goes on, and, and, and um, shall you ask me of things to come? And, and, and concerning work of my hands, you command me? It's the same train of thought, obviously, right? Does the, does the baby come out and say, what are you doing? Does the, do you say to the father, what are you begetting? Of the works of my hands, you command me? You're telling me what to do, what I should do? So if you read the whole context of what he's been saying in Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 45, he's saying, don't question me. Don't question me. Stop questioning me. And it's, he's, he hasn't changed to suddenly say, but do command me. That would make no sense. The previous sentence, you're going to tell me what to do? And then the very next verse, but, but tell me what to do. So God's not crazy. He's not a psycho. That doesn't mean... The concerning the works of my hand, you command me. You know, you command me. No, he's saying, you command me? No, I don't think so. So, but if you haven't read the context, if you're just someone who flips through the Bible and finds a verse and go, oh, look, this means that. No, it doesn't. Not in the context. He's yelling at them the whole time for trying to tell him what to do. He says, I formed the light. I agree, dark. I, there's no God beside me. Were you there when I made all this stuff? The person who was there, show up. If you can predict what's going to happen, go ahead, bring him to me. And he still said, it's the same conversation. How dare you tell me what to do? Next verse, verse 12. I have made the earth and created man on it. So he doesn't say, so, that, you know, that's why you get to tell me what to do. You, no, he's saying, and you command me? I don't think so. I have made the earth and created man on it. My hands stretched out the heavens and all their hosts. I have commanded 
So clearly he's not saying, but do command me. He's saying, I'm the commander. I'm the maker. I'm the potter. You're just the clay. I have raised them up in righteousness, verse 13. And he's now referring back to Cyrus saying, I'm telling you, because, and I didn't read the first five verses, but they're all about Cyrus. He's going to come and deliver you, which is horrific to them. It's like saying, now I don't know what your politics are, so I'll, I don't mean this. It's like saying, and, and Putin's going to come and do this, or Hitler's going to come do this, or someone who you consider bad. Maybe you may not consider Putin bad, but you know somebody who you consider bad. He's going to come and Pol Pot is going to come and show up, and you know the, the Kim Jong Un or whoever, whoever is going to come and, and rescue you, and you think, no, oh my God, that person's going to come because he was the king of Persia. He was threatening them all the time, and God's saying, I'm going to use him actually to attack Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Iraq. I'm going to bring Cyrus, the king of Iran, Persia at that time, and, and deliver you. And you're going to use that person to deliver us? He's saying, yes. Again, verse 12, I made the earth, created man on it. My hand stretched out the heavens and all the hearths I've commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, like Mount Cyrus, and I will direct all his ways, and he shall build my city, and he'll let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts, which is exactly what he did. He showed up in... so. Uh, in 700, he's saying this. In 600, really, 595, 585, he's, uh, they were taken off into captivity, and they were there for 70 years. And then Cyrus came and said, go free. And over the next 30, 40 years, they slowly went back to Israel, and they rebuilt the temple, just like God said. And God's saying, I'm telling you what's going to happen, but if somebody knows better, please let bring them forward. I, I would love to hear what they think is going to happen. And what they thought was going to happen is that God was just going to let them go scot free. It's like, oh, no, no. Uh, consequences are coming. You are going to be taken to captivity, but I'm going to free you. I'm going, don't worry, because I control everybody. I control everything. Next chapter, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. So th this is the good part. After, because when the when the person who loves you is administering the consequences, it's for your good. It's for our good. Remember in Hebrews, they said we had fathers who chastised us uh, as they saw fit, but God does it for our good. He chastises us for our good, right? So here's the good part that's going to come from it. Now, because you've gone through that captivity for seven years, 70 years, you're going to suddenly start teaching. Your, your children are going to go, oh, we need to study the Bible, which happened under Ezra and Nehemiah. They came back and they, oh, look. There's a Bible here. I didn't know that. Let's read it. And so he's saying, all your children, Isaiah 55, verse 13, all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Sadly, their children, 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 they drifted away again. And that's why Jesus had to show up and say, okay, sorry, I keep getting been warning you. Now this was your last chance. Verse 14, in righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. So you're going to be far from these things. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. So this is, again, this is the devil. The devil's going to get in some people's minds, and they're going to try to attack you. Because the devil can get in people's minds. I'm not saying there's not a devil. He gets in people's minds all the time. But he's saying, so they'll assemble, but not because of me. Because some people are going to attack you once I send you back. Don't worry. That whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coal in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. So the blacksmith who blows the coal and heats them up and creates these instruments some to attack you, who the, 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 the blacksmith who, who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work to get you. He says, I, I created him, by the way. I created the devil. It's not, it's not, I, so don't be afraid of him. I have created the spoiler to destroy me. I, he's just a created creature. No one's created me. That's what he's trying to say. I've been here from the beginning. Nobody created me. I created everything. So I'm still in charge of it. Yeah, he is. So therefore, verse 17, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Because I, I'm his daddy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I'm in charge of you. So once you start doing what I ask you to do, the devil's still going to try to attack you. But it won't prosper. No weapon that that calls me. Because I made him. So I, he, he can't go any farther than I allow. Don't even worry about that. Just do what I'm saying and I'm going to be protecting you. But when you step out from under my protection, 
and you just start doing crazy, I'm going to give you 100 years worth of warning. I'm not just going to suddenly slap, right? But then I'm going to allow that calamity. I need you to know that it's me. Otherwise, you won't repent. If you think it's the devil, you won't repent. You'll just say, look what the devil did. It's like, no, I did that. I'm trying to get you to repent. So at this point in Israel's history, they're serving other gods. They're serving other Baals. They're living horrible lives. And God warns and warns them, sends prophet after prophet after prophet to warn them. They don't listen. So he's warning them now, a hundred years from now, calamity is coming. But don't worry, even after that, I'm going to bring you back. Your children will be safe. The devil will try to come at you. But don't worry, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is not everybody's heritage. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, though. If you're, if you're trying to serve God, he says, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So those are three chapters, Isaiah 50. Uh, four and 55, and I probably meant to, yeah, and is that 53, 54, 55? Anyway, oh, 44, 45, and 55 is where he's having this whole discussion, but explaining, I don't want you to think that it's anybody else but me, otherwise you won't repent, but don't worry, I'm going to make it all work out okay, and even the devil, when he gets in somebody's head and they assemble against you, he won't prosper, because I'm the one who made him. So don't worry about this. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Oh, good. God's on our side. When consequences come, they're from him to teach us. So I'm not worried. I don't go, oh, no. I go, okay, Lord, why are these consequences here? Please let me learn the lesson so I can repent and you can remove these consequences and restore everything. And when the devil tries to attack us, I don't worry either because it's, oh, it's just the devil. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. He, won't, he, can, he can try, but he's not going to win. That's the, that's the heritage of the servants of the Lord. But, he, but don't confuse that the devil is God's opposite equal and all these horrible things. Are, he's like, no, when something huge happens, it's me. I create life. I formed art. It's me for your good. And it will not overwhelm you. It'll just be for a time period. And then I'll be able to remove it. If it's the devil, you're in trouble. But fortunately, it's not. There's no other God besides me. So the thieves at this point that Jesus is talking about are the Pharisees who are giving such horrible teaching that they're leading the people astray. And God predicted that there's going to be shepherds who, if you aren't paying attention, they're going to be able to lead you and they'll just eat your fat. But if you're paying attention, if you're studying the word, you will recognize these false prophets because a stranger's voice you won't hear. I will tune your ear to mine and I will lead you right out away from them. I'll lead you in and out of good pasture. But that's for those who are listening, like the blind man who they tried to trap. He says, well, you kicked me out of the temple. I still know that was the Messiah. I know that God healed me. I know that they couldn't be, you can try to make me say it was the devil, but it wasn't the devil. It was the Lord that healed me because the devil can't open blinded eyes. When did that ever happen? So he heard my voice, even though he didn't see my face, he heard my voice. Followed my instructions, went down, got healed, and now that I've introduced myself to him, he's recognized me. My sheep hear my voice. So John 10, verse 10 says, I have come that they might have life. I, that's why I'm here, to find my sheep, to give them abundant, and, and that they may have it more abundantly. That's why I'm here. Because, and I predicted I would come and do and bring life to you, all those who want to hear my voice. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11, for thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my seed sheep and seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep so I, will i seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on the cloudy and dark day so my sheep they know my voice i'm going to find them i'm going to seek them out whatever i'm going to pull them out of this shelter and this situation and that wherever they've been scattered if they're if they're just saying lord i'm in this horrible situation i allow myself to get into but he says i'm going to find them I'm going to pull you out of that situation. I'm going to pull you out of this. I'm going to, I, I will pull you out and I'll find you because you are seeking me. John 10, verse 11 says, I'm the good shepherd. Now, before he said, I'm the door, I'm the door, I'm the door. Don't you think I'm the, no, I'm the door? Now that I'm done with those, now I'm, I'm the good shepherd. I'm changing the analogy, Jesus says. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, he's contrasting himself with those Pharisees. Remember, there was two sets of Pharisees. They're the ones who were purposely misleading the sheep, hurting them. But there were the Pharisees who were with him who were like 
allowing it to happen. They were allowing the sheep to get killed. They were allowing the people to be taken care of. Complicit. They're complicit in what's going on, even though they're not doing it. He said, you're still blind because you think you see, you think you're doing the right thing, but look what you're allowing to happen. So now he's contrasting himself with them. Earlier he contrasted themselves with the bad shepherds who are doing all the bad stuff. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, meaning he doesn't let all this stuff happen. He goes ahead and says, no, even if it might mean, because the reason they weren't speaking it was they were afraid they're going to get kicked out of, the, out, of the, out of the temple. Well, too bad if you get kicked out. You're allowing other people to die because you're afraid. But the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. A hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. And he says, that's what you're doing. You're allowing people to come in and just, and you're, not, you're fleeing. You're not protecting them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Uh, and again, I just remind you in John chapter 9, it says, when some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said, are we blind also? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains because you think you're doing the right thing, but you aren't. Zechariah 11, 17. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. There's two types of shepherds. The shepherd who takes advantage of the flock and eats their fat. But woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A short shall be against his arm and against his right eye. And his arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. So there, ha! Look what's going to happen to you. But, so if you allow this to happen. Now, fortunately, they heard that. And several of them, like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and others, they did start to stand up for Jesus. When we read later on in the book of John, we'll hear them standing up and saying, no, and that's not right. Yeah, but they weren't doing that before this time until they heard Jesus and they thought, you know, he's right. We need to stand up. So you will see them do that later on. And because John's telling a good story, John's very specific about what he's trying to tell. John chapter 10, verse 14. Uh, he says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. They're going to be united, which is what we're supposed to be, like one flock, one shepherd. We're supposed to be united, not have all these factions. The church is so divided, it's ridiculous. We're supposed, but, but I'm going to bring in the Gentiles, you're saying, and we'll be one flock. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. So he's saying, see what I, I sacrifice, even if it means that I might get kicked out of the temple, I'm not allowing these sheep to be harmed. If you call yourselves shepherds, then you need to do the same thing. Now he's going one step further. I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. So I, I know what's about to happen. I, I and I'm doing this on purpose. I, I know that I'm about to go to the cross. I, so I just want to be clear to you, Jesus is saying, I am laying down my life. No one's making me do this. I know what my actions are going to do. I know that I'm going to eventually end up on the cross. I'm just trying to let the disciples know, let the Pharisees know, I know this is going to, you're going to be so shocked. I can't believe they grabbed Jesus. Yes, I'm telling you it's going to happen. I know it. I am laying down my life. He says, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I'm going to rise and I'll rise again. I'm going to rise again. Don't worry about it. This command I have received from my father. And I have this, I put this in bold because he's saying, Jesus is saying, I follow the commandments of God. Even though I am God, while I'm on earth, I'm acting as a man. Even though I'm still God, I'm God. There's only one God, but God put himself into this man suit. And while I'm here, I'm showing you how to, I'm your example. I'm the first of my many brethren. So see how I'm following God's commandments? That's what you have to do. That's why that verse in Isaiah, command me, command you me the works in my hand. No, you don't command God. But if Jesus had to follow God's commandments, I think that we have to. We don't get to tell God what to do. And there's a there's a theology. And I, I know it's gonna some people just picking me off, like oh, he doesn't know. But there is a theology where we kind of tell God what to do, where we command God. We command the works of his hand. You're supposed to command God and tell him, heal this, do that. And it's like, no. If God speaks to your heart, we speak out what God has said to us. If God has said, you know, I want you to go pray for that person, then we do it because we're following his commandments. We don't decide who needs to be healed, who's, who, who gets punished, who goes free, who goes. We don't get to, but it, it'd be fun to think that. 
because we and we watch too many superhero movies, and it'd be really fun to go open door, car, fly. We you know we want to have superpowers, but we don't. But when we're following God's commands, we do. If God tells us, I want you to go then pray for that person, and I'm going to heal them, He's going to do it. And so Jesus was, says, I'm I follow his commands, even as far as my death is concerned. This command I have received from my father. So I'm going to lay down my life so I can pick it up again. Verse 19, I'm almost done. Therefore, there was division again among the Jews because of these sayings. They're like, what? Do you believe him? Many said of them, right, verse 20, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Because he's saying crazy things about laying down his life and picking up his life again. He's crazy. And others said, verse 21, these are not the words of one who is a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And again, I'm, on, I'm stopping there, but I'm saying that's the, these are the bookends for the conversation. Everything Jesus is talking about is revolving around the blind man who was kicked out of the temple by the Pharisees and how they're treating people. And Jesus is talking only about the Pharisees. The devil did not kick the... Him out of the, he's talking about the Pharisees and what terrible shepherds they are. And you Pharisees who are with me, you need to step up and not keep letting these things happen. You need to speak up. Your salvation depends on it and also the lives of these other people. So don't you can't live your life afraid. He's saying this to his disciples. Uh, you, you're gonna, he tells them, you know, you're going to be persecuted and follow. But, you have to, but you've been chosen. Because I'm like, oh, I wish I had a disciple. Do you? Because they had horrible they. But so, yeah, they got to talk with Jesus and, and, and share him and him's. But they had, there was a price, you know, to being that close to Jesus. And there is a price. So uh, he's telling them, y y you need to just be obedient and not, you need to lay down your lives for the sheep. That's your assignment. And he's, he's giving, because his, his time is short. We'll see in the next verse or so. It's, gonna, it's winter, like, and he only has till next March. To, to, to really make a point. So he's making very strong points from now on. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. And um, uh, uh, thank you again for, for, for tuning in. I can't wait to read all of Rodney's comments. Uh, thank you, Jessica, Baldwin, and Donna, and everybody. And everybody, those who, you don't have to sign in. I know that other people out there, Ronnell and a bunch of people who are listening, Jan Skinner. So thank you so much for, for tuning in. On Sunday, we'll be back in the book of Exodus, and then next week I will continue here in the in the book of John. And so now I get to go back to the Dodger game. Okay, amen. Bye-bye.